Uh, roll film. Hey, welcome everybody once again to uh. Astronomy Daily Live. It's two hours UTC, and here we are again, gathering together to talk lots of astronomical things, sciencey things, space things, nerdy things, that kind of stuff. Let's hope everybody's doing well out there. I'm going to look at the chat, keep track of that, all the great shenanigans going on there. So, good. Well, Bobby's good. Atta, how are you? Pretty good here. I'm going to turn down the brightness of my screen. One of the reasons my face always looks so bright in these chats, I'm sitting in front of a 27-inch monster <laughs> bright screen. So, Hey, Cosmic, what's up? Hey, Otto. Hey. <laughs> Dad Bobby. Look out. Watch out for him. He can't be yeah. <laughs> No, he, uh, he he definitely keeps keeps this live stream on its toes. So, for sure. For sure. No shenanigans. Tom, hello. Hey there, Tom. Nice to... See you. Hey, I noticed, and um, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but yesterday was the birthday of Richard Feynman. Um, I don't know if you uh, knew that or not, Tom, but but um, Feynman was a um, was just an absolutely amazing physicist. Um, worked uh, uh, well. His, his early years, he was a, I guess he was a grad student or maybe a postdoc um, at uh, Los Alamos. So he, he worked on the development uh, of the first atomic bombs. Um, so do you have any um, stories about him, uh, Atta? No stories other than he suffered the same pains of hell that every other scientist who worked uh, on the bomb suffered from. Yeah, yeah. You know... Uh, it, it must have been horrible to, to do that science but realize what you had done. Yeah. You created something that could destroy this planet. Yep. And, Literally. And... And we've got crazies with their buttons right on the, you know, yeah. fingers right on the button, right? Crazy people. <laughs> the only good news right now is most of the bombs currently available to terrorists are not hydrogen bombs. They're atom bombs. And they're much less powerful. Uh, of course, tell that to the people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki how trivial the re we weapons were that hit them. I'm sure they won't agree with that statement. They probably but, won't. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me no, that no. was tell me that was the dude that came up, that came up with the A bomb that pretty much killed World War II altogether. Uh, yeah. Well Feynman was was a very, very bright um, grad student and postdoc um, yeah. that worked sure on the bomb. He, you know, he wasn't 100% responsible or anything. You know, the 100% no. responsible person, you know, um, um, when you're going to point uh, fingers was uh, Oppenheimer. He, sure. he, he was the dude that that was totally in charge of that, that yep. thing. And yeah, uh, so. no, you know, I mean, I think it actually drove him crazy. Because, because how there's page master. Oh, oh. Yeah, hey, they're page master. And not only he did the, he he helped with the development of the atomic bomb during World War II. But in the nineteen eighties, as a member of the largest commission, which is the panel that investigated the the Challenger disaster. Yeah, yeah. He, he is he is credited with pioneering with the field of quantum computing, introducing the concept of nanotechnology as well. well that's cool. Yeah. He's uh, a well-known man, too. Oh, very, yeah. very 
well though. You know, yeah. nanotechnology today is where computer technology was 60 years ago. If you knew today what nanotech company to invest in, you'd be a multi-millionaire 20 years from now. But yeah. who knows? You know, well, which one's going to make yeah. it? And maybe that one doesn't quite exist yet. It may not. And you want to... Hey, back so, in the day, you, people were voting for National Cash Register. <laughs> what? And did you not know when Richard Feynman died at the age of sixty-nine? I was only I was only just seven months old. <sighs> got um, I've got a couple of his books. I can't uh, I can't find them now. Of course, um, I've got one that's called "Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman." <laughs> which is just, you know, it's a bunch of stories, uh, you know, that he he told. He 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 was a character and a half. He was a prankster, but really, really, really smart. He he could pick any lock, any lock. He could pick it. He was an expert. Mm. I mean, like beyond expert. Um, in everything he did, he he was like the master's master. <laughs> so, you know, absolutely brilliant, learned things extremely fast, you know, was able to, um, uh, um, uh, you know, change Can the you elaborate on if Feynman at all didn't develop the atomic bomb, someone else would have figured it out. Oh yeah, yeah. No, that's just what happens. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. That's you know there, um, you know, and that's an interesting, you know, discussion too. It's like you know, what if, um, the Germans you know, developed, uh, and you know, successfully, um, detonated, um, one of these atomic bombs you know, before. The United States did. They would have won the you know, war. Yeah, because you just, I mean, with that kind of 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 um, control, the enemy just has to put down, right? It's over. <laughs> it's over. So so yeah yeah, and you know that, uh, but yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing you know to think about. Um, because you know, the Germans were right, right behind us. Um, they would have you know, been right they, ahead of us if Hitler hadn't decided he was going to murder most of the top people's top scientists in his country hmm. because they were Jewish. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a crazy, crazy, crazy thing. But uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I guess you know. In that particular circumstance, I'm pretty grateful for the outcome. I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, it it's really mixed, though, right? Because you've got this 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 um, you know, at least you know, sort of the immediate sense. You have you know a lot of destruction, right? Tens of thousands of people just vaporized, right? Yeah. Um, and tortured and burned and and just yeah you, know. you got me want to watch the man in the high council because i think in the and uh what it is i think if so it has that what if if um if something so something else happened like like the axis was able to win right they would be a little bit different yeah things will be you know Things would have been extremely different, but but um, yeah, I think they were they were probably a good year or two um, behind us. Um, so so I mean, uh, they they had you know by by the time you know we detonated our bombs over Japan, um, you know Germany had already surrendered, right? That was VE Day. 
which uh, I don't remember exactly when that was. Was that in 45 also? Um, early 45? Don't look because, at me. I was just a little kid then. <laughs> because, uh, well, VJ Day was sometime in August, right? Because um, I think um, the first bomb was something like August 8th, August 14th, something like that. Um, uh, yeah, Feynman diagrams are are um, brilliant ways of of sort of um, expressing what's going on with. Um, Particles. Okay, uh, so BE day, we are at the 13th UTC time. Um, and that was one, two, roughly in UTC time five days ago. Five days ago was VE day. Okay, so that is victory in Europe. Day. That is when the Germans surrendered. What year was that? 1945? Uh, I think okay, so. Um, so May, like like what? May, uh, May 7th? Okay, May, May 8th and 9th, 1945. Okay. So, 1945, yeah, 1945. So, yeah, you know, I think... I mean, my understanding, there's a great book. Oh man, can I find it? Ah, oh, I've got I've got the other one. I can see the other one, but there's another one that I've got that is um that's a great, great, great book about the making of the atomic bomb. And you know, they talk about all these things that that you know, I mean it turns out that um, Germany, I think, I think they said was a couple of years behind us. So, I mean, they would have had, you know, to continue the war at least a couple more years. And I don't think they had a chance to do that. I mean, you know, you don't give up a war easily. So, you know, when they did, they were done. Right. So, um, so yeah, okay. Well, that was May, and then I think V V J Day was sometime in in August, right? Because uh, they did the first bomb, and they did the second bomb, and it was after the second bomb that they uh, surrendered, right? Okay, so V J Day is on September second. Oh, September second. Okay, okay. So it took them took them a while because I think I think Hiroshima was like mid August, right? Don't remember exactly. I thought it was a little more rapid than that. So maybe it was the end of August. Yeah, don't remember. But yeah, um, a, you know, a really really amazing story. Of you know, the development of the atomic bomb, it 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 uh, you know they just sort of uh, uh, happened upon this this thing, um, and and uh, it's like wow you know if you take this and this and just physically put it you know close to one another, it gets it gets hot, and uh, that's pretty amazing. So you know. Um, um, that's when that all um, started. I don't know exactly what Feynman was doing there. I think he was part of the theoretical part, but I could be completely wrong about that. I'm not quite sure. Um, mm. I just so. wish I could visit the World War II Museum in New Orleans. Hmm. Well, maybe someday. So cheers. I've got the uh, hydrogen hydroxide here. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of like a bit weird that Google's got it as September 2nd, but I think the actual surrendering date was at August 6th. 
Yeah, I, you know, I'm thinking that August 6th was Hiroshima and something like August 8th or August 9th was um, Nagasaki. Those were two different kinds of, of bombs. You know, they both used the same um, fissionable um, material, but the way that they exploded the bombs brought you know, those two pieces um, together. Um, they did it in um, two different ways. The first one was called Fat Boy, and it it was a, a, a sphere. And the idea is, is that you, know, you have these explosives all the way around that you, you know, explode simultaneously. And that rams, you know, the fissionable material together in the center and boom. So that's one way. The other way that was used with the Nagasaki bomb, and I forget what the name of that bomb, bomb was, um, but um, okay, they basically so used, Page Master called they, they called the names Little Boy and Fat Man. Little Boy and Fat Man, yes. Um, so um, Page um, Master knows everything. Page, I can't Page Master is on top of things, which he which, is a uh, superhero. <laughs> he is. He really, really is. Um, so, so yeah, you know, and they're. There are just so many things that I don't know, you know. So, um, so Fat Man was, you know, the spherical explosive one. Little Boy was, um, it was like a shotgun, right? They had, you know, half of the material down, down here at the end of a barrel, and the other half, half here. That, you know, at the time that they want. The, you know, the bomb to go off, they shoot this stuff at it, and then boom. So, and you know, they both worked. Um, they both worked, worked um, really, really well. I think the first bomb that they ever blew up at um, Trinity site, um, I think that that was, um, that was a fat man too. I think it was a spherical one they sort of determined that um i wish i could find that book um okay so batman feeling plutonium feeling weight 14 pounds or 6.4 kilograms yeah. last year at 21 knots and 88 tj wherever that is that's um, tw um 21 kilotons so 21,000 tons of TNT. And so, what is this? What is this TJ is? I'm not quite sure. That's some kind of unit. Maybe like terajoules. Could be, could be terajoules. It's just an amount of energy, right? So okay. with 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 14 pounds of raw of material, you can. Um, have the explosive force of 21,000 tons of dynamite. So that's that's um, pretty amazing. Um, yeah. So yeah, and I think the, the Trinity one... Okay, so the little boy feeling really uranium 235, feeling late 140 pounds or 64 kilo, last year 15 kilotons of TNT or 63 TJ. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You, so you realize, whoa, here. You realize that there are schools of thought who say that we would have won the war anyway without dropping the bombs. Yep. And Harry Truman did it to demonstrate the firepower we had to the Russians. Well, which 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 was a very successful thing. It was very successful, but that didn't help ease the conscience of the scientists who developed it. No, no, it got completely out of hand. Um, you know, it it's uh, you know, it's I I have to agree that at least what I've heard, uh, we were we were we were winning the Pacific yeah. War. 
Um, but I mean, maybe they were talking two or three more really intense years. Yeah, might have been. And, and wow, American lives would have been lost, but whether it would have been enough to justify killing hundreds of thousands, I don't know. Well, and mm -hmm. and you know, um, you know, basically, um, um, letting that genie totally out of the bottle, right? Never to never to come back in at all. So you know, the cat is out of the bag, right? As they say. Yeah. For that, one. that cat yeah. is not in a bag. <laughs> so I didn't know we had a good clean advantage in the Pacific theater than in the European theater. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, I believe it was a tougher thing, but, um, uh, hey there, Chuck. Nice to see you in the chat. What's up, yes, Chuck? Beware. Beware, beware. And yeah. uh, thank you for actually commenting on my Weatherfax decode, Chuck Nagelin. You have a Weatherfax decode? Cool. Yeah. Nice. I'm still looking for that great, great, great book. It must be it must be in one of my other piles somewhere. Because I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it on any of my shelves. Nope. The messy shells back there, I'm not seeing it. So, yeah, it must be... Time to turn right. your office upside down, as Eddie Murphy would say. No, it's already <laughs> upside down. There, <laughs> I can't do any worse than what it already is, or better. <laughs> um, anyway, the name of the author is Richard Rhodes. And I believe the name of the book is The Making of the Atomic Bomb. And um, just a really, really, really good, good book. It's actually a technical book. He actually gets into some, you know, quantum mechanics and, and, and you know, some pretty, some pretty heavy stuff, you know, to try to set the frame, right? You know, what was happening in the early 30s um and all of that um and i think the first um fission experiment was um the university of chicago and i want to say like 1932 or 33 something like that um uh without there would have never been a nuclear bomb she she discovered nuclear fission. Oh, okay. Um, wow. Page Master, when when was that? I am I I'm not surprised that I have never heard that name. Sadly enough, I'm not surprised. Um, so yeah, well, and extremely observant. You know, we're we're just trying to uh, you know do things and you know the other half of the population is actually paying attention so <laughs> all right well cool yeah so look up um richard rhodes and i think it's called the making of the atomic bomb really 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 great great one the one that i do have here is actually one that i haven't read yet but it's Making of the hydrogen bomb. Richard Rhodes. So um, this one, as I said, I haven't read because I know now that it's going to be really, really, really intense, <laughs> and I'm going to have to concentrate. But you know, they've got all kinds of, you know, pictures and things in here, which I always like. Um, so, yeah, just lots of uh, lots of different um, faces and, and stuff. I don't know, who, I don't know who they really are here. Oh, here's a here's some kind of a 
some kind of a device. Maybe these are explosive packs around them. They had to shape the explosives in a particular way um, because it's all about, you know, squeezing that stuff down. And I think, um, I, and maybe somebody, you know, c can um, correct me on this. Um, but do they use a fission atomic bomb to detonate a hydrogen bomb? Is that how that works? I don't remember. Yeah, I think I think it does. Yeah, I'm not. I I guess I've never confirmed that. Probably knows. <laughs> probably knows. But um, but I, it's kind of like a bit where there's a lots and lots of competition of who should discover nuclear fission and who should discover the atomic bomb. Yeah, I mean, it was inevitable, right? And, and you, you know, the actual names um, all, almost, almost don't really matter. Um, you know, I mean, it, it seems to be um, almost like a, a pattern. Um, and, you know, our technology is just uh, increasing exponentially. And uh, interesting, speaking of technology, I need to try to focus this thing. Come on. Come on, you can do it. Bam. Okay, that's better. Anyway, I, you know, um, um, I'm kind of interesting about about um, these these kinds of of bombs. It's the kind of thing that I would absolutely love to see, but hope that I never do. Right? Because they're absolutely beautiful. Right? They're they're absolutely just incredible. Um, there's a there's a YouTube channel. Uh, I forget what it's called, but it's just videos on, you know, the atomic bomb uh, tests. And they're, you know, I think they're absolutely beautiful. But I hope I never have to actually see one because that would be uh, pretty life-changing either life-changing or life-ending. <laughs> so, you know, but these are just, you know, absolutely, absolutely beautiful. That's uh, Fusion bone to detonate a fusion bone that he doesn't know, says Page Master. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know. Um, and... It would be in this book. I just have to read this book. This book will talk about, you know, how how they get to fusion. Um, I'm not exactly sure how that's done. So, but you know, this book would definitely talk about that, um, at least in as much you know detail as sort of allowed. But you know, these are just absolutely. I think they're they're just absolutely gorgeous, right? Really amazing. You can see the trees down here. You can sort of see you know, the scale of this thing, and you know it's it's a it's a complicated it's a complicated thing. Yeah. So you know all kinds of stuff in here. So yeah, pretty amazing. And uh, I don't know if um, Feynman was involved in fusion or not. I can look in the index here and just look for Feynman really quick. Uh, Feynman. Richard Feynman, he's mentioned a few times. But if he's only mentioned a few times, probably not involved. 
202. Um, yeah, he's he's mentioned, but I don't think he was involved. I don't think he was involved. Anyway, I guess yesterday was uh, was his um, um, birthday. Uh, if if you really want some amazing physics lectures, get his lectures in physics. Um, they're they're uh, um, they're um, something that I have always wanted and have never been able to justify the expense because they're they're very very expensive, um, as I recall. Not insanely expensive, but expensive enough that's like, well, you know, do I need these? No, nah, I really don't. Really, really don't. Everything in these books I can find elsewhere <laughs> for a lot less. So, um, but, you know, uh, they are his lecture notes um, while he was teaching at, um, I think he was, was he Hartford? I think he was Harvard, maybe Harvard, maybe Cornell. Hmm. Don't remember exactly. Anyway, good books here. Good stuff. As I said, yeah, I think um, Page Master confirmed for me the title, um, the making. Yeah, the making of the atomic bomb. So yeah, good stuff. But yeah, yeah, you know, it's a. Uh, um, it is definitely a question that um, you know all those scientists had to um, consider at some point you know either either while they were doing it or um, afterwards and they they had to deal you know with the consequences Einstein right wrote Truman saying um, I, I'm pretty sure he said don't don't do this, right? Um, so, uh, and, you know, Truman um, went ahead um, anyway. Ultimately, it, it was up to him. But, you know, they, look, let's face it, they they wanted to try it out. They wanted to see what, what would happen under real conditions. And, and uh, so I think they were probably a little trigger happy too. They really wanted to push that button. Um, as, as, all, as all scientists want, you know, they want to know what's happening, what's going on, all of that. So, all right, well, cheers. All right. Well, I hope everybody's doing excellently out there. It's um, it rained here today. <laughs> rained, which so on this day in 1930, the Adler Planetarium opened. It was the first planetarium in the Western Hemisphere. Oh, very cool. Adler Planetarium. Where where is that? That sounds um. I don't know. That sounds uh, like it could be anywhere. So where where is that located, Adler? Chicago. Okay. All right. Very cool. Is that still an operating planetarium today? I don't know. I don't know. Um, maybe Tom knows. He seems to know so much. <laughs> I don't know Very about cool. today, but I went to the University of Chicago and it was operating then. <laughs> cool. Nice. But that was a long time ago. <laughs> millions and millions of years ago. That's right. Back in the dinosaurs, you know. <laughs> it's not a door to heaven, it's a store gate. I remember those. <laughs> yes, it is. All right. Tom was uh -huh. there last Something last year, my past so. is still functioning. Cool. I never went to them. I had no interest in astronomy back then. 
If I hey. had to, if I ever have a chance to go to Chicago, I would definitely will try both sides of the competition of deep dish pizza. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were gonna say, you know, you're gonna try out the planetariums. Yeah, that's what I thought too. <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter for you? Well, he'll get a oh. dish pizza and take it to the Hey, I can still visit the planetarium if that's what you want. Yeah, just, <laughs> just don't be slopping around all your pizza in there. <laughs> Boy, Tom was there last year. All right. Yeah, very cool. Impressive. Yeah, we have a um, we have a planetarium at the University of Arizona here. Um, oh, that is um, fabulous! Uh, and well, you know, interestingly enough, it it uh, um, it it is sort of the the uh, least important facility on the whole campus. It's it's uh, neglected. Um, when um, I was actually talking talking to um, one of the, uh, he's the, oh, I forget, he he's one of just like a skeleton crew there because a couple of years ago the university shut the planetarium down um, due to budget cuts. Um, actually, I think that was uh, back like ten years ago or so. And it was shut down for a number of years, um, and just restarted up a couple of years ago. And they're they're like in you know complete disarray. <laughs> so, so, um, but yeah, um, that's a great planetarium. I worked there. Um, I actually worked well, there. You're a great guy out where you live. My God, here I haven't had a clear day. I don't think there's going to be a clear day until you know two weeks from now. We, you know, it has been a very unusually cloudy year here also. And I mean, it is May 12th here, right? Um, and today it was cold. In fact, we had yeah. snow, um, snow come down to probably about, about maybe 8,000 feet or so, which is, which is really, really low. It was cold here today. It was cold. And it's, you know, um, this is supposed to be, you know, almost the hottest of time of the year. It's certainly supposed to be the driest. And it rained all day today. Yeah. So it's just. Uh, yeah. The I, weather in here has been random as well. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I love you it. Get a lot more clear days than I do. I, I know you do. Carolina yeah. apparently gets a lot of them too. Yeah. Or he wouldn't be taking those movies. This this year has been really cloudy. I mean, oh I've, yeah, right. I feel sorry for you. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, I've had um, uh, I've had probably maybe twenty clear nights, maybe. 20 Maybe. clear I haven't had 20 clear nights Maybe. since I started astronomy last June. <laughs> Maybe. So, no, but it's usually, you know, at least, at least twice that, at least. So it's really, really, really strange. It's really, really, really strange. But yeah, no, I totally I get you. I'm trying to use my equipment all over again. It's, a, <laughs> it's so terrible. Yeah, no, you just have to um, take those opportunities when they come up because they will. They oh, will. I, it's just. I, mm. I'm just dying to get out there and try that new light pollution filter and everything. I would go. Yeah, and it's just been, it's just been cloud, 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 huh? Yeah. Uh, well, I'll survive it. I yeah. Get, business to do the next couple of days anyway. Watch. And it'll be clear when I can't go out. And where where I'm at, it's either going to rain, is it going to clear up, 
I mean, the forecast may say there's going to be rain and thunder, and the next thing you know, that ain't happening. Huh. huh. <laughs> or, or like one can say, like, it's supposed to be the next day. It's, it, it's supposed to be now. <laughs> it's yeah. going to be now, if you, if you can say it right. Well, I won't get at the big picture of life. If those are the largest problems we have, we're probably pretty lucky. <laughs> uh, I would totally agree with that. Cheers. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, cool. They Let's should um, think that the meteorology is a little bit more messed up than ever you should. Well, as I was going to say, don't I. I don't want to start on my rant about um, weather prediction because that's uh, that's a long and involved thing. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to go over to uh, archive.org and look at the latest and greatest astrophysics papers yeah. that uh, have probably just come out. Let's see what we've got. And, and I might try a little experiment too, but we'll see how that goes. Let's dive into these and then maybe I'll try an experiment, but maybe I won't. So, all right, so this is for today, right? So these are the latest and greatest um, astrophysics papers as they call them, but there's all kinds of other things in here, right? All kinds of physics stuff, mathematics, computer science, biology, finance, stats, electrical engineering, system science, economics, um, and all uh, sort of the, you know, most newest um, publications, you know, um, papers that have been accepted for um, publications in these um, scientific journals. Now, most of these papers are going to fly over everybody's heads, even the astronomers, right? Way over. I have no idea what he's talking about, right? Um, and so um, if you feel exactly the same way, well, you know, you're part of a big, a big, big, big club. Just, you know, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, you know, uh, you don't have to understand all of this. There, uh, that's okay, you know. Um, but if you start with the easy stuff, you know, things that you can understand a little bit, and then expand from there. Um, and so what I like to do is I just sort of like to go through here and look at the titles. These are the titles here. And then these are the abstracts. They're sort of like um, the executive summaries. It just sort of, you know, says the whole thing. This is it. Blah. You know, one, one big thing. And it's usually sort of a long paragraph. Um, and you can sort of see, you know, these are, these are all sort of, you know, the same, same length. But what I like to do is I just like to look at the titles and see if anything grabs me. So if there's anything you know, that grabs anybody else, just say the word. I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be, be me, but um, last neutron star mergers, cosmic superstring detection. Wow. Magellanic stream. Yeah, this is some kind of uh, of uh, stream of material. I think it's going. I don't know if it's be going between the um, um, Magellanic clouds or if it's a stream that goes between us and the Magellanic clouds. Uh, I forget. Um, Titan's um, dynamic love number. <laughs> Titan. Titan has a love number. <laughs> now, I don't know if I've ever heard of a I don't love know, number. Is that? 
All okay, right, well, I heard a love portion, but love number? Yeah. Well, you know, considering, um, I'm considering that it is Mother's Day. Maybe we <laughs> should uh, dive into this a little bit here and uh, see see what what uh, Titan's dynamic love number is. Yeah. I mean, is it like? 42, um, <laughs> 13, 3.1415. Um, so let's find out what a love number is. So um, this person is at Princeton Institute for Advanced Study. Cool. I have never heard that expression before. I never have either. And that's why we are here. I want to find out what the love number is. Because, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm extremely curious. So right in the abstract, he talks about the love number. The dynamic quadrupole love number of Titan. It must be named after somebody. That's all I can think at the yeah, moment. Uh, yeah, probably uh, yes. somebody named Love. A theoretical love number. Dynamic love number. Okay, so that's the abstract. Let's see if we get into the introduction. Okay, Titan, the most massive satellite of Saturn, is on a 15.9 day orbit with eccentricity about 0 0.288 inclination respect to equatorial planet Saturn. Titan's spin frequency is synchronized with its orbital mean motion, hmm. tidal potential, blah, 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 blah. The tidal um, deformation yields a gravitational potential that is proportional to the, uh, ooh, I don't remember what that Greek letter is. I think that might be a capital psi. Maybe it's a psi. Don't remember exactly. I'm just going to call it psi static by the dimensionless fluid love number K sub F. So the fluid love number for a homogeneous body is 1.1. And this is saying the Titan's love number is 1.01. Yeah, so mass concentrating towards the center results in a love number that's less than 1.5. So I would think that that's, that's a pretty strong, strong indication. So I guess this, this love number has to do with, uh, very, very roughly speaking, with like the internal structure of, in this case, Titan. I guess it would work for lots of things. Like, I wonder what the love number of the Earth is. I wonder if you can uh, find that out. <laughs> I don't know about love numbers, but I, I just did a search on love numbers in astronomy, and I get a love, a, a Wikipedia thing that says, Love numbers are dimension, dimensionless parameters that measure the rigidity of a planetary body and the okay. stability of its shape change in response to, to a tidal potential. Gotcha. Yes. Uh -huh. I am, I'm also on that page. So, yes, it was Augustus Edward Hugh Love. All right. Yeah. Yes. Mr. Love, E or A A E O H A E H L. So, all right. So, yeah, yeah, okay. So, but let's see if we can if if we have a love number for Earth, because that might help us sort of understand how that number. Because you know, just saying that it's 1.01, well, I don't know what that means. Well, I don't either. So if we have a reference, 
reference to what Earth's love number is. Whole tide love number. So they're saying here that it's 0.3531. Hmm. That doesn't uh, jive with the Wikipedia information. Or, no, with this here. Um, yeah, I don't know. Okay, well, as I said, you know, a lot of this is just going to fly over the heads of everyone here, including my own. At least we know what a love number is now. <laughs> yeah, it's the right. I mean, it sort of has to do with the with the uh, you know with the structure, you know, the inner structure of some object. So yeah, that's that's cool. And yeah, for a completely homogeneous object. Um, which means, you know, it's the same, same kind of stuff all the way throughout. No, no changes in um, material or density or anything. It's going to be at 1.5. And anything less than that is going to have some kind of stratification. So that's kind of cool. And Titans, they've measured to be 1.01. I'm just going through here, seeing if there's any uh, pictures. <laughs> it's just a bunch of uh, squiggly lines and math and stuff. Lots of math, no pictures. Lots of math, no pictures. Yeah. But this is a long, long paper. Okay, so, oh, wow. Okay, so this is actually how to calculate the love number, right? If I'm understanding this right, I think so. That's pretty cool. It's all just algebra, though. That there's no there's no um, calculus here, as far as I can tell. There might be some vector algebra. Yeah. Um, maybe. Maybe it depends on how you know, they're using these um, symbols. But yeah, I mean, all of this is just algebra. You just plug in your numbers and you get, yeah. a, you get a result. So there's no calculus here, no nothing. Yeah, just a bunch of algebra. All right, no pictures, lots of references. That's always good. Okay, let's go back. Implies a stably stratified ocean. Hmm, interesting. Okay. All right, let's uh, let's keep keep going here. Testing version. Da, da, da. Modeling spatial distribution. Uh, an origin of carbon monoxide gas in debris disks. The end of runaway, how gap opening limits and final masses, how gap opening limits the final masses of gas giants. Hmm. Don't know what that is, gap opening. Uh, distortions in the surface, mass scattering. Don't quite understand that one either. Uh, neutrinos, data processing pipeline of the Herschel Hi Fi instrument. Uh, what is the Hi Fi instrument? Uh, no, it doesn't say in the abstract what the Hi Fi science instrument is. Oh, well. So, yeah, you know, I uh, 
I haven't mentioned this this yet, and I probably should. Um, every every ten years um, in the astronomical community, there is what's called a decadal um, survey, where the astronomical um, community develops a, a a list of things to do for the next 10 years. Um, and so 2020 is coming up and I've noticed that there are a lot of these papers, a lot of these Astro 2020 science white papers. Um, so I think if you do a search, let's just, do it. If we do a search for that title, you will you will hopefully see, <laughs> hopefully, that you get a whole bunch of yeah. So, fifty six results. So, and just talking about every every single aspect of astronomy it, it, it's uh i haven't really looked at any of these but these and i'm not quite sure how this works in to the overall plan i'm not quite sure if if these are suggestions if these are what you know has sort of been decided i don't know when this is actually decided if if they have a meeting in 2020. I'm not quite sure how that works. I forget. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it's, you know, it's a way for the astronomical um, community to sort of look forward and say, well, look, this is what we want to do in the next 10 years. And I think uh, I think um, for the most part, those most of those things are pretty much accomplished each time. So yeah, check those out if you sort of wanna wanna see where where the astronomical um, community is sort of looking forward. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Population synthesis. C for galaxy and GC twenty one ten. Determination of the invisible energy of extensive air showers. Hmm. Molecular cloud complexes. Whoops. Whoops. What did I miss? No. I I killed my I killed my uh, window and it killed us. I was trying to recover <laughs> the inner link from uh, the mix because what Brian wants me to do is I need I need to help him with his, with his interlink and um so and something happened and and when I refreshed it it was started working so I didn't need to reset it and stuff but it wasn't coming right. on for some reason. Very very good. Hey look here is something on the International Space Station. I don't know about you and this is a little bit of a rant but I don't hear a lot about results um, coming out of the International Space Station. No, neither I, Yeah, you know, I've complained about that for years and years and years, and, and uh, it's all I've done is complain about it. Um, but, but uh, you know, it's like, yeah, what, what uh, you know, um, once in a while, I hear things, but I usually have to really dig um, 
And I would think that, you know, NASA would be a little bit more vocal about, about things. Um, but maybe, you know, I mean, it's entirely possible that I'm just sort of in the wrong um, uh, area. Right, because I think a lot of what they're um, working on up there is like biology and chemistry. Yeah. And, right. and yeah, so, you know, maybe I'm just not hooked into that, that uh, um, pipeline. And so I just don't hear that much about it. Yeah, um, let's work on that a lot because if we're ever going to go anywhere, we have to understand how to control the environment where we are and the well, I, technology and chemistry have the answers to that yeah and i just hope that they haven't found like a major problem right and that's why you know they're sort of hush hush about it um Me too. i don't know i don't know i yeah. just hope that they haven't so found check a the chat is <laughs> something that he found i don't know what it is um Oh, that's an article on um, love numbers, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. Let me see. Yeah, love numbers of the moon and, and of the terrestrial planet. <laughs> Page Master, you're amazing. That was it, uh, so is that this, up some time ago. Is this the same love number? I guess so. Right, because yeah. you're talking about tides and okay, right, okay, okay. it's 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 the love number. It just right. happens to have applied it. Okay, and, uh, so so here's. I don't know why they don't have Earths on here, but here's apparently the love number which they call K two. Is that um, am I uh, my understanding that correctly? K two. Oh, where is K two? That's the first time they mentioned K two. It is in a table. Oh, now here. Yeah, that's a love number, isn't it? Yes, K two. Yeah. Okay, so that's for the moon. Okay. Oh, 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 yeah. Okay. So it's kind of interesting that they don't have a measurement for Earth. Um, maybe we can't measure ourselves. <laughs> it's entirely <laughs> possible. <that> somewhere. <laughs> it's entirely possible. But here are the K numbers that have been calculated, I guess, in a couple of different ways. Not quite sure, but uh, except for Mars, they're they're all kind of sort of close to one another. I'm not quite sure what this number is, but okay. But they. They said that the love number for Titan was like 1.01. So <clears throat> that's that's a lot more than all of these. Yeah. So I don't, yeah, I'm, you know, I mean, we'd have to get into this a little bit more to understand. <clears throat> because, I mean, it seems like it's a lot more. Maybe it isn't. Um, yeah, yeah, there's just too much you know, not, not known. Um, and right, see, so from, yeah, oh, okay, so this is just some basic info. Um, so, well, cool, kind of interesting, even though I'm not quite sure how to, you know, I mean, I don't have a reference, so I'm not quite sure how to, how to um, get a sense of those numbers. Right. So here's some planetary models for various planets. 
cool. Anyway, <laughs> well, cool. Thanks, Page Master. That's that's uh, that. I was um, nice of you to uh, to uh, throw that up there for us. So okay, well, let's see. Let's let's keep trying here. Yeah. So anyway, here's some kind of a. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what this is. A cal cal calorimetric electron telescope. Not quite sure what that even is. Lots of authors though. Holy moly. <laughs> oh, and 24 not shown. <laughs> Man, I hate to be a part of that, right? <laughs> Uh, let's see. Huh. Symbiotic body. Feel better, Bobby. The Andromeda Day. Yeah. This is the place to relax. And I I absolutely love love to sigh. So so uh I I like it. That means everybody's just chilling and relaxing and that's exactly what this is all about just you know think about you know cool things for an hour or so every single day i like it um yeah. how to find a planet from transit variations yeah yeah that's uh that's kind of fun Direct imaging rocky planets from the ground. Wow. So, well, that's coming. I don't think that we're quite there yet, but I see a familiar name, Richard DeCaney here. He was a, uh, he's a good friend of mine. Um, works at, um, I think he's still at Palomar. I don't know. He was a, um, when I was, um, staff at the U of A, he was a uh, grad student there um, in, in the optical sciences department, but he uh, um, was, um, he was interested in um, telescopes. So, you know, he had a lot of um, interaction with us over at the astronomy department. Um, because we like telescopes too. <laughs> uh oh, I think we better. I think we better close it out right now because Alta is about to turn to a pocket. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, you know, I I think I have to agree with that. Let's let's uh, let's get out of here while the going's good. And yeah, we'll do this again tomorrow. Just having fun, you know talking astronomical things and just you know sitting back relaxing a little bit you can see the little friend back here hasn't moved hasn't moved at all so but as soon as i'm done with this she'll she'll wake up and say ah it's you you're back but all right i'm gonna get out of here for now so take care everybody peace cheers and all that i'll be back here again Tomorrow, two hours, UTC, more astronomy, more space, more chill. Yeah, just having a good old time. Okay, everybody, hold on to your hats. It's a fast spin. It's a really, really fast spin. But spinning around, spinning good. But it's it's super, super smooth. And um uh, you know, we, we don't go flying off. Uh, you can do the calculation yourself and you will find that the, that, that the gravitational force is uh, several orders of magnitude larger than the centrifugal force. Um, so don't have to worry about that whatsoever. Got to worry about uh, lots of other things instead. Hold on to your hats anyway, because we are moving really fast. All right.
take care, everybody. Peace, cheers, and all that. Live long and prosper. And I will see you. We'll see you all next time. Thanks for coming in. Awesome. Bye.